Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or good day, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to the next episode of No Dice, No Glory. Sponsored by our jobs that actually pay us money, we're coming to you, not at all live, from an abandoned arms factory deep under a mountain in West Virginia. We are proud to proffer to you the finest in wargaming coverage. Without any further ado, let's get this show on the road. Hey, well, thank you very much, Sean, for that rousing introduction. So we have a very special podcast today. The founders of No Dice, No Glory want to mark the 100th podcast that we've had on the, on the site and talk about No Dice, No Glory since its inception and some of the fun we've had for the last uh, two and a half years. Or it's, uh, is it three years? I don't know. I can't add. So, I, look... My co-host, my, my, my co-bloggers need no introduction, so I'm going to let them do it themselves. Hey, Mitch. Hey, everybody. Tom Burgess here. Hey, it's uh, Matt Varnish, a.k.a. Dennis Campbell. Tom um, Chairborn Mullane. And this is Troy, the editor of No Dice, No Glory. Yeah, so thank you guys for doing this. I got to be honest, I forgot. Uh, Cause I've just been crazy busy, but I'm so happy to, you know, first of all, talk to you guys again. Um, and then hopefully we can all get together at Historicon or something, but <clears throat> did you guys think that we would make it to a hundred podcasts? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Really? I think we're very dedicated right from the beginning. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, a lot of us, the military backgrounds, we're mission focused. So it's not, not too surprising. I think. How yeah, the mis- military, yeah. The military backgrounds really helped me seeing Mitch be in the military inspired me, you know, so, so if I could do it, despite it, yeah, if I could do it, anybody could do it. Anybody can. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. So since this is a, our hundredth, we're going to talk about not just our podcast, but we're going to talk about everything we've done. So we have been around since um, January of 2018. So uh, it's been, well, three and a half years about, I, Hope I get my math right. We've been pumping out articles, usually three per week for all that time. We've had a ton of articles. Uh, I'm going to go through what were some of the the most enjoyable articles that you've written that you were excited for other people to read uh, since you guys have been writing. So go down the line again. Let Tom Burgess start. Okay. Yeah, I'll keep in the same order. All right. Uh, I think uh, my favorite things uh, uh, has been the after action reviews that I've written. Uh, I certainly uh, enjoy those uh, because I enjoy playing the games. And I enjoy sharing the pictures and letting people be part of that 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 game even after the fact. So that's my favorite thing that I've done. Uh, my favorite thing that other people have done have been the uh, uh, particularly Paolo's articles. Uh, oh my the, God! Yeah. The, yeah, the software and some. He's just in some very interesting gaming. Uh, some of the. Uh, uh, I guess fields of glory, uh, uh, computer gaming, but also, and he also, uh, he and I were starting to do 3D printing at the t- same time. So I really enjoyed what he was putting out for that, and that really helped me as well. Uh, for me, uh, I'll first of all, I'll second that I love uh, Tom's uh, after action uh, reviews. I know for me, <clears throat> when I started doing my video battle reports, which I've been slacking because I just haven't been playing because of COVID. Uh, lately, and the the couple that I have, just the video didn't turn out. But uh, I specifically did not do uh, battle reports in the picture format, just because WWPD uh, had done them, and uh, so at least there's other people doing that same format. Uh, so for me, not so much the battle reports, but the the ones I seem to get, I don't know, <clears throat> a lot of feedback from uh, were actually the uh, my Africa core. Uh, hobby articles and my uh, U.S. Team Yankee, my Texas uh, National Guard. Those are uh, so I good. Get, I get so questions good. on this. Thanks. I get questions on those about every week. Uh, you know, through DMs or whatever. So I'm more than happy to ping, uh, you know, to call back on those to those articles. Um, <clears throat> and also just getting some of the other Canadian contingent people uh, in on. Um, no dice, no glory. Namely, uh, Rob Kelly, because uh, he was doing his Canadians, and we had when the especially when the Canadian book was coming out, everybody was like, 
oh, how do you paint these? And I was like, Rob, you got to do an article. You got to do a bunch of articles and every, everybody's, you know, anybody who's looking up anything Canadians for Team Yankee goes to Rob's articles. And then now that we've got Scott on board, so that's, uh, uh, those, those are good articles uh, just, just from our end uh, up here. But uh, by and large, like, unfortunately, I, I don't read, I don't read them all. Don't listen to all the podcasts, but that's in a way that's good. It's because we've got such a wide scope that uh, we've got we've got something for everybody. So uh, unlike some other, you know, more laser focused uh, groups. Mitch, you want to go last? Do I get to go next, or you want to go? Next? I'll go last. That's fine. I, I'm interested in hearing what you you guys enjoy. Okay. Um, I think I think the highlight for me over the last three and a half years has been. Um, like, I mean, I've really enjoyed writing the reviews for different books for Battlefront. I still have an enormous collection of British stuff. And I got to, like, one of my first articles, I think, was my write-up of um, the, the British Airborne that took me four years to finish. But, you know, I managed to get it all done. Um, I, think I, I think I had a bet with Dennis about that. You did? Uh, yeah. And I, like, barely got it under the wire. Uh, yeah, that, that's become a recurring theme with me. If I don't make a bet of some kind or have some artificial deadline... I'm going to get crushed. Um, I would say um, the other big highlight for me has been doing all the fun stuff with Firelock, with my Tunez, with Rufus, um, but mostly with getting to know and befriend um, Tyler Stone and Glenn Van Meter because we've really been, we chat like every day. Um, we've had a lot of fun hosting paint nights for people. And, you know, on a good night, we'll get like 18 to 20 people popping in and getting motivation to paint, not, not just Firelock stuff, but literally anything. Um, and I find it's been a nice way to maintain a sense of community during a time when people can be pretty isolated. So, um, yeah, I, yes, I was going to ask you, that was like my trick question for you, Tom is, uh, Hey, did you notice that uh, because of the website, you got into a whole nother game? Yeah. You, you really started, you dragged me into that. I mean, I mean, I, dra drags the wrong word, I guess, but yeah, you can't, you know. can't rape the willing and Troy. Yeah, it's uh, been an experience trying to come out of playing one game almost exclusively at the beginning of this blog or shortly before, and then diving into the world of Warlord games as uh, one of John Russell's raiders, and suddenly being the guy on the uh, blog that gets to write up a uh, overview or review of almost every new game that comes out of Warlord. Those guys don't stop writing. So, you know, they, anytime a new game hits, it's almost like I've got to got to take a look at it, figure out if it's even one I want to play. But at the same point, I got to, you know, deliver a quality story to the blog that tells people this is what the game is. This is why it's there. I loved uh, doing the original Warlords of Erewhon, but, you know, it's it's a newcomer in an already crowded fantasy field. So trying to find players for it, it's, it's been fun trying to learn the new games, but at the same point, trying to find the players to play against, especially during 2020 was next to impossible. So that's kind of what I liked about it. But then I'm also the guy that sits and tries to catch all the comma splices and, sprinkled commas and Mitch's run on sentences that go on for three or four years. Yeah. <laughs> we're all deeply grateful that you do. Yeah. So I, I'm reading almost every story that comes through here. Um, to be honest, sometimes, especially on a Sunday night where I'm got the eyelids propped open, just trying to get through what's going out Monday morning. I, I just look for the red underlines and try to get get it into coherent fashion good enough for Monday morning uh, reading. But most everything else I, I do try to read through. Paulo has been pretty good. Those of you who saw his uh, articles at the beginning, his English is getting much, much better as he writes for us, which is, if I understand correctly, that's one of the reasons he started to write for us. And he's... Uh, almost never needs a lot of correction now, whereas early on, there was a little more than uh, fixing Mitch's stories to fix Paulo's, but now he's almost spot on every single story. So, Paulo or me? 
Uh, Paolo, not you. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think Paolo's got better grammar than me, and I teach writing to high school kids. So yeah. good on Paolo. Yeah. And, and I, I am Mr. Run on Sentences. Um, I tell you what I've enjoyed about watching Troy. First of all, Troy is the reason why people come to us and say, your blog is like varied and it's readable. Like they're interesting stories. And I said, well, if you met me and you meet some of us. We're not that bright, but Troy has worked so hard. And I would say Troy is the unsung hero of no dice, no glory. Um, we need to name an award after him, <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I can't thank you enough. So one of the things I'm going to say that was the best story or the most interesting story I wrote was actually just a few months ago. We wrote a story about the passing of John Tiller, and it is one of our most clicked on stories. People loved it and the comments that we got. But I got a comment from John Tiller's brother, and he thanked me for the article. And I think I shared it with you guys. And, like, he didn't know so many people. You know, his brother touched so many people. And I, I, I got a little choked up with that because, you know, we're just uh, you know, a bunch of guys that love gaming and we're addicted. But that was something I thought was really cool. And then some of the folks uh, from, you know, John Tiller um, Software – we're very grateful to us, <clears throat> and they even put a link in on um, on their website. And I think that was just very rewarding uh, doing that. And uh, you know, through uh, through that family's tragedy, you know, we we can help them out a little bit. But I I tell you what, I've enjoyed all the folks that we've brought in since the inception, and that's a lot. We've brought in a lot of folks. And just like getting to know them, like I love talking to Paolo all the time online, um, talking about games and gaming. And, you know, I knew you guys already, too. And, you know, I love each one of you. But, you know, to me, it was just like hearing, you know, from new voices that, that come and write for us. And some of them don't stay very long. I mean, we had that doctor. What happened to him in COVID, right? Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he, he said he was too busy to write for us. What the hell does he mean? And priorities. And just and just the people I think that have come and and written some really good articles for us and you know even if it's just short term, it's they're still popular articles. But I think I've enjoyed that the most. And you know, we all said in COVID that this was a sense of community for a lot of us and it really was and you know, our Discord channel always has people popping in with questions. And I noticed Matt is always there to answer them. So I, I, I looked at, you know, yeah, there's a lot of blogs out there. There's a lot of podcasters. But I actually think we did some good for the community every once in a while. Which is number two, a uh, question I was going to ask you guys. So, you know, we've been very active uh, in hosting tournaments and, and hosting events. And I know that slowed down over the last year and a half. But what were some of the most memorable, or interesting tournaments that you guys have been a part of since we started this whole thing? Uh, for me, it's always uh, the, the the Wolf Craig events that we run. Uh, always, uh, they're, they're uh, battle, you know, Flames of War, Team Yankee focused, and always uh, red on blue and and specific theater themed. Uh, I, I just really enjoy it when we try to get more into character and not more about, you know, what meta army it goes up against what other meta army. So those have been the most enjoyable ones for me. Uh, for me, <clears throat> before COVID, obviously, um, we did not so many local tournaments anymore uh, just because we lost the the one decent <laughs> gaming store that, we, that did hold events. Um, so we... It's just a couple. Um, so then the focus then became driving all the way down to the United States to do uh, the Fall Ins, the Cold Wars, and the Historicons, which is where I met all of you guys. So uh, that's that's still the way to go uh, for us. We're trying to figure something out for Canadian Nationals. We're not going to be able to have a Canadian Nationals uh, in September here in Ottawa, but uh, there's new organizers now. Um, a uh, bunch of army guys uh, in the Canadian forces there. Um, you might recognize some of these names from the forums, Nick Foxtrot, Ryan Sullivan, or, or Facebook and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Jed, uh, all those guys, they're the ones kind of organizing. We're going to figure something out for either late 2021 slash early 2022. Maybe it'll be a series of local events, but uh, yeah, with a loss of Canadian nationals uh, and my ability to come down to the United States because of COVID, um, for me, the the events and painting stuff is the vicious circle for me. So for me, if I have an event that's coming up, it'll I'll ramp up my painting to go to an event. Even if, even if you know it's like, well, you know, it, it's not the best list, but it'll get me to paint stuff. And then when I go to an event, see other people's armies, it kind of gets the you know the mojo going to paint more. So that I've lost that in terms of the impetus. Uh, but in terms of events, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I didn't get a chance to do. I know we had a themed event um, at one of the Cold Wars. I couldn't make it because of work. But uh, seven days to yeah. the Rhine. Seven yeah. days to the Rhine. Yeah, I would have loved to yeah. have gone to that. And uh, people have used those rules, and I've heard nothing but really good things about that. So that's something good we did. I'm going to assume that we have those published somewhere. Easy They're in to our get to. our forums. Okay. Perfect. Yep, easy to get to. Well. Tom Mullane is going to say Firelock tournaments, but Tom has a very interesting story story to tell about his first Firelock tournament that I think needs to come out on this podcast. You're going to make me tell the story every time. Um, I, I will say that I think one of the more rewarding things that I've gotten out of all the gaming is, um, I mean, surprise, surprise, I'm a teacher who likes to teach people. So I, I like running demos, and, and I think that the thing I, I'll I'll throw up there is like my favorite thing. Before I embarrass myself, is um one of the last big conventions we all got to do. Um, Mitch really went out of his way to organize stuff with a bunch of different companies. He talked to John Russell at Bolt at um at Warlord. He talked to to Rufus and, and Mike. He tried to talk to Battlefront, and we would we set up this huge table full of demos, and people would just walk over. And so I had a bolt action table set up. I had a firelock table set up. Um, we also were doing um, the two different like one three hundred scale style C games. And over the course of that day, that I'd agreed to just do demos for for firelock, um, I think I demoed the game five times. And e- each time, somebody was like, "Oh, oh, okay, walk me over to the, the booth and tell me what I should get." And I, I mean, I feel kind of like a drug dealer, but I walked them over there. You know, and each person dropped, you know, at least 200 bucks on an army. Um, and, and I like, well, my goal obviously is, is to sell products just to get people interested in a game. I think it's really good. I think like a side effect of the, the over and over practice of teaching players that know these kinds of games how to play has been that I start to incorporate it in my teaching. So I've played Blood and Plunder, Bolt Action and, and uh, Battlefront games in my classroom as part of military history. I used all the oak and iron models to do this uh, golden age of piracy simulation where all the kids were backstabbing each other in, in a, in a world history class. So I, I and Mitch and I have talked about this at length because I even had Mitch and his crew come in to give a talk to my, my uh, military history kids. And that was, that was a highlight of, of the year for me this year during a really, a really junky COVID year as a, as a high school teacher, but we, we made it through pretty well. And so I, this- I, I surprised him too of some of my answers. You did. I didn't expect to get some of the answers I got, but I was, yeah, I'd love to do that again for sure. But I, the first Firelock tournament I ever played in, I didn't know how to play the game beforehand. And Mitch basically taught me like the night before in a demo. And then I kind of had like an unpainted set of dudes to try to use. And so I didn't understand how the book works because I didn't really have much opportunity to talk to people about it. So I thought that instead of the point values, so there's like, There'll, there'll be a unit type like, uh, you know, filibustiers or, or um, you know, lanceros. And there's a number next to them. Anybody who's ever played this Firelock games knows that the number means that's the number it costs to buy one model. The model's four points. But I thought that that number meant um, that's how much the unit costs. Like you, you get four models for that point. And so when I went to play in the tournament, um, I calculated the first two games. They're like, wow, you have a lot of stuff on the table. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it ain't no thing. <laughs> and like, I, like and, if it's Saga or something, right? Oh, yeah. Like, and like I, I still seven, lost seven models for one point. Exactly. So I, I lost spectacularly both games. And then the third game, 
a guy who I had taught the game to goes, yeah, you're not supposed to have that many models. Like, you know, that's per per model, right? And I'm like, no, no, that's like that, that's that's per unit, right? This is how, Preston, how much? Preston Jacob. So you go ahead. So you how much? So it was a hundred point event, but how many points was that army you had on the table? Uh, it was like 193 points. And um, how close did you come to winning any of those games? I lost all three games uh, spectacularly <laughs> badly. Like it wasn't even close. And I would say that for the first year and a half of playing the game, um, demos, tournaments, I never won one game. But but and I've said this a million times, but it really is a tribute to the elegance of the rules and Mike Tunez's cleverness as a designer that it, I never got discouraged playing the game because the game was so much fun. I didn't really care that I lost. And I know that more competitive players will be like, you know, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Min max. And I'm like, yeah, okay, well, whatever. I, this one looks cool. So that's the way I play. But yeah, I've, I've had a blast um, learning the games, getting to know new people, talking to you guys. And I'll be really excited when we can start meeting up with more people again and, and building a community. Cause I think at the heart, that's what um, one of our like underlying mission statements is something that, that Mitch has made, made frequent mention of. Yeah, you know, we may all get together and hate each other. So for Troy, I'm going to put Troy on the spot because Troy did something really cool. He went with John Russell, and they did the release of the uh, the Korea book. And if it's not one of your more spectacular moments, you got to tell our audience about it because that, that was a pretty, pretty cool event. <laughs> well, it, I I don't know where to begin with that one because it wasn't what I was thinking of in prep but no uh john russell and steve smith wrote the uh bold action korea book hope i got steve's name right yep um and john came out to uh, los angeles california where i was at the time due to my wife's career she had taken us out there and so we set up with the local hmgs group which is HMGS Pacific Southwest, so PSW. There's the shout-out for them. Um, we had three different game stores that John was going to go to, one each day. So we started off with one north of L.A. I, no, I'm sorry. We started off in Pasadena. Then we went to one north of L.A., and I can't remember, Game, game Ogre? I just drawn a blank on it. But um, we ran Blood Red Skies. We ran a little bit of uh, John ran people through the Bold Action Korea, just a quick demo on that. And we were hanging out with a retired two-star general. So unlike most of the world, we don't get to do that. But we had General John Harrell, U.S. Army uh, retired out with us and he hit both of the stores on the first day and was able to give John some direction because one of the uh, heroes in the book from Bold Action Korea is Sergeant Reckless. Sergeant Reckless is a horse that the Marines purchased in Korea and used as an ammo carrier. And there was one particular uh, battle where the front line shifted almost up to uh, the position of the gun that was being serviced by Sergeant Reckless. Sergeant Reckless did not need to be led. They had trained her to uh, walk the, the same route back and forth, back and forth, bringing the ammo up. So as uh, wounded Americans would stagger back to the line, to the gun position, they would either load the serious ones on Reckless or the uh, walking wounded would accompany Reckless back to uh, get medevac or get treatment. And Reckless kept coming, got a couple Purple Hearts out of her service, and then retired to Camp Pendleton. On his way down to San Diego, John Russell stopped by, paid his respects to Sergeant Reckless, and if you get the Bold Action Korea book, she's in there. I think she's 125 points. I don't have the book with me, but she counts as both an ambulance and an ammo carrier. So it's a lot of points for one model, but it's it's a model that I said if I ever painted Korea, I was definitely going to add it. 
And I'm going to tell you now, my turn to look stupid. So John had all these conversations with me about Sergeant Reckless because Troy and I did help him proofread the book. And um, I didn't know Sergeant Reckless was a horse until like (laughs) after your the trip to San Diego, because one of you guys took a picture of it and posted it. And I'm like, wait, Sergeant Reckless is a horse. Was I not paying attention? (laughs) And uh, so I've never admitted that to anybody, but uh, yeah. So there you go. Sergeant Reckless is actually a key. I don't know the correct military term, but a commissioned Sergeant um, in the Marine Corps and she retired back to Camp Pendleton, and her pay is what paid her room and board to stay at Camp Pendleton for several years after she retired, and she's now buried there. They've got a uh, small memorial at the stables, and then they've got a grave marker, and John was able to do both. He he went unaccompanied down to San Diego and then flew out of San Diego. So Didn't the uh, Army, sorry, doesn't the Army, or is it maybe the Marines also have a dog as well? Yeah. Sergeant something something. Yeah. Like the mascot or whatever. Yeah, Chesty. So this, this, oh yeah, that's right. The the story about the uh the ammo horse really reminds me of um Oitek, the uh the ammo bear. Yeah. Yeah. That they had, which I, I thought was a crazy story, and it's like, no, they had an ammo carrying bear in Italy <laughs> that after the war the soldiers from Poland would go back to the zoo in London. Give it and cigarettes. Give it cigarettes, because for some yeah. reason it liked cigarettes. It's like you well, can't you make know. that story up. Yeah, I'm surprised point. none of you guys mentioned the roundtables we did for HMGS. Oh, oh yeah, I, I, I had that written down, but I, I I was talking too long. So, but I think interviewing Benerson Little and getting to talk to an author whose book I just read was a really cool experience. And I think pulling that off in the depth of COVID was was a pretty impressive impressive thing to do. And I'm glad we could help out HMGS because I love the cons they put on. I think it's a great organization. Um, they also helped me out with uh, a grant because I used it to purchase like books and, and terrain for kids that I used at school. And I did a whole D-Day board. I think I did an article about that. That was a cool one too. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all uh, did something for that um, for if not one, but both, but look at who we had on that. We had, not only like we had almost everybody warlord has as a game designer between the two sessions we had with them and i thought that was pretty incredible people still watch those videos um for the first one um tom with the guys from breakthrough assault had phil yates and uh who was the other one was wayne turner wasn't it yes it was wayne uh that was an amazing interview people still watch um, but yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was interesting to get a mix of, you know, we had board gamers there and, and other stuff. I, I thought that was really like a lot of fun. Um, uh, you know, w- hopefully we don't get to do any more of those because we'll be having the cons in, uh, in, um, in real life. And it was interesting. So HMGS does run their war college and I've never gone to any of their events. If I'm going to go to a con, I'm going to game. Um, but I think a lot of people were asking, how did you get such a diverse and what they thought hard to get people to come talk? And I said, well, part of it's COVID. You know, they want to get, you know, they're selling something. But the other one is, I just said, all you have to do is ask. Yeah. And I, I thought that the participation we had, like Glenn got the guys from Battletech. That's, that was cool as hell. Um, it was cool. That was really cool. Yeah, I mean, and we got all these great game designers and, you know, we had some sprinkling in both of them of some people that do some professional war gaming. I, I just thought that was amazing. I had a lot of fun, so. But, Troy, did you have something else other than Sergeant Reckless that you wanted to uh Well, the, uh, the cons out in Los Angeles, there's actually three of them that have merged. They used to be three separate locations. Plus the HMGS PSW does a uh, fourth con every year, but three of them are under one umbrella. They're always at the LA airport Hilton. And I had been running flames and team Yankee out there since I didn't play it, but I at least could handle the rules and ran attorneys for uh, the local players, but when I switched 
fully over the pulled action, I started looking and talking to people and I said, instead of just running a generic turning, why don't we turn, turn it on its head? Go ahead and take an idea of like bold action. It's not a vehicle game so much. Everybody wants a tank, but you're really min maxing to get your, your steward with a machine gun spam in there. So I said, everybody's got a tiger or uh, an IS or something that is a big tank with a big gun because they bought into it early thinking, I'm going to run that. And then they realize the points are out of balance for what you get to survive in a tourney setting. So we turned around and did a uh, bring out your big guns. You had to have a tank like that. Turn the rules. So you're within the rules, but turn the expectations on the head. And those were fun, fun ways to game in a tournament setting that made people really reconsider their list and kind of play on the fly as they were going through it. Everybody seemed to have a lot of fun. So that was a, that was a good tourney that we ran out there. Yeah, most people uh, don't, you know, hopefully most people don't look at us as guys that put on crappy tournaments, but I thought that, you know, because I remember, uh, you know, you talking about it. You even did a podcast from an event down there, and it's hard to get you on. a. I think this is your third time on the air with us or on the air, period. Let me give a shout out to that one event down there because it, it makes sense. When I did the podcast from, um, I forget which one of the three, but they're all the same. Uh, they're all at the same location with the same crew running them. Uh, Strategicon, I think, is the overall umbrella organization. Then each con has its own name. The local guys in the Flames of War, um, Kevin and Igor and... Uh, some of the guys out of Las Vegas got together and did the Iron Man tourney down there. So it was Flames of War for 24 hours. I believe it was eight rounds. And you could take a round or two off, go grab a nap, but you didn't get any points for it. So I was interviewing those guys, and they were all gravel-voiced uh, at 6 a.m. when I walked in on Sunday. But they... A few of them had taken naps, but almost all of them had gone straight through. So shout out to those guys for running a, an interesting event that hopefully got a got some podcast hits on. Yeah, it did. It did. A lot of you know what the biggest question people asked us about that was um, how much speed and meth did those guys take? So, <laughs> because I, I wasn't, wasn't there, I said a lot. Yeah, I wasn't there either, but knowing them, it was mostly Starbucks and whatever sweets uh, somebody brought into the con after hours. Oh, I think it was speed and meth. Uh, I, look, I don't know any good. There's no good tournament gamer that doesn't do meth on a regular basis. <laughs> well, I'm going uh, to put that out there. Well, I'll disagree. Uh, I, and of Maybe course that's I'm why kidding. I always lose. That's why I lose. Yeah, 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 just, just uh, the same your drugs. Yeah, hit the meth, but yeah, please don't anybody do drugs. I mean, it's um, it's bad. That's our PSA for this uh, this event. So we talked about some of the stuff we did in the past that we really liked. Um, what do you guys think the next hundred podcasts are going to be like? The next uh, thirty eight months of um, no dice, no glory. Like, what is something that you think we haven't done that you really want to do? In the next uh, 100 podcasts. Well, certainly more event coverage because we should be having more events. Uh, it would be good. And I think uh, I'd like to see us try to run more uh, in, you know, No Dice, No Glory sponsored events. Uh, I think that is one thing we just started doing just before the uh, the COVID started putting a kibosh on things. So that would be really cool going forward. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you what, we already, for Historicon, we already got asked. So. Yeah, we're definitely going to do a lot of stuff because there's so many games we play, you know, uh, within the website. Uh, what about you, Dennis, uh, in Canada? Oh, I don't know. Or just what do you what 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 are things that you would like to cover more in the next three years? 
Well, I don't know about me personally, but I, I just think that right now, <clears throat> from a North America standpoint, um, I think we got the bases covered uh, for the United States and, uh, well, at least Eastern Canada. But it'd be nice to see some more um, European uh, representation. I know we've got uh, Paolo and uh, I, I think a couple of guys from England, but it'd be nice to have you know, a bit more representation over there. I mean, I get it. There's there's some other groups that are based over there, like uh, is it Breakthrough Assault? I, uh, is yeah. That, there's there one of them. One of them's Australian. One of them's uh, British. I always forget which two. But yeah. And, uh, yeah. And we have an Aussie now, so. Well, yeah, but I I, I still think it it'd be nice to have a bit more um, coverage from events over there. Yeah. Um, because because we we've, we've got the North American events I think pretty much covered, um, you know, either me myself or Scotty or uh, you know Matt McKenzie when he was still active, uh, we did the you know Canadian Nationals, and a few other events, but and you know the America we've got covered, uh, but but I think it'd be nice to get uh, a little bit more coverage. Yeah, Paolo covers all the stuff at Nilly. You know, we used to have a writer from Denmark, and I don't know what happened to him. Uh, I think he became a father. I think uh, fatherhood. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll uh, do online. it. Yeah, no sleep, no sleep, no sleep. That's for sure. Yeah, it was wow. Benny. Yeah, Benny Christensen. That's right. We we should see if he's still alive or something. Or no, you know what? I know he is because I know Rob Kelly. Um, he's going over to Denmark, and uh, he's going to. I think he's going over to Denmark. Cause his wife's from over there visiting the family and i know he's trying to line up uh i know i know he's attending a tournament over there a late war tournament with benny and those guys at whatever uh gaming group they've got in denmark because uh, i know he's he's been practicing uh with the, with his list so i know he's around I, he's, he's like you said fatherhood's probably made it so that benny can't write uh i mean other things come up who knows but that's probably it you're right yeah, and we're trading, actually, speaking of UK, we're trading Scott Roach to break through assault for the next year. Oh, traitors. <laughs> um, so we uh, we traded him. So I, I gave him over to Mark, because I, I love Mark, and I love talking to him. And uh, I said, so what are we going to get back in return? And uh, I think he's going to send us a used cricket bat. So I would think we made out in that trade. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Scott's a pretty good painter. But it's a cricket he's a, bat. He's a very good painter, and he paints quickly, which is what drives me crazy. You know what, though? I, I, I think he's planning on going to salute if it's on next year. So at least we'll get coverage of that, hopefully. Yeah. If he's, if he's not too busy buying more miniatures that he doesn't need. Well, we're all busy doing that pretty much at all times. Yeah. Well, Malane, what do you want to see us doing more? Um, I do remember, like, it was it was a highlight for me back when uh, WWPD was, was still around, like I was excited to go see the guys podcast live. And you mentioned that earlier. So I think I definitely want to do that. Um, at one of the HMGS shows, if, if people want to come see us, I think it'd be fun. Um, I know Dennis is already more experienced with this, but it's always kind of intimidating to learn something new. Cause I feel like I'm just crossing the threshold where like learning new things makes me cranky, not in terms of games, but in terms of like technology, because I would like to try to do like a video recording battle report. Um, but I, I don't know how tricky it is to edit them. And I need to kind of dive into that. Um, the other thing that I th I've done this before with my friend, Greg McNally, we did like a Spanish civil war thing in 28 mil, which is all his models, all of his terrain. And it was a really fun game. Then we play tested it a bunch before we went down to do it. But I've never been a, a GM for anything other than a tourney at one of these conventions. And I'd like to go and do it. So I think I, I was thinking of doing it with Glenn because Glenn's got a really cool scenario for like a raid in Panama. And he's been working his butt off on that. And my, my plan is to go and visit him down in Maryland this summer while I'm still enjoying my time off as a teacher. Um, sucks for all you guys. And, yeah, uh, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Tough. That's tough out there. <laughs> And um, yeah, and getting it tested out because I want to be able to to run a game at a con. And I really went down the rabbit hole with terrain building. I think Mitch warned me, like you never come out of there because I bought like a foam cutting table. So I want to do more tutorials for people. I want to learn more stuff because I think some of the things that I get to see people build 
um, like on, on sites like uh, like like Guy and Joe Forrester's site, Blood and Pigment, some of the the cool terrain that they've put together. It, it's it's really inspiring to see some of the work that other people do, and it makes you want to makes you want to do some of that stuff yourself. So I got a lot of things to look forward to in the next hundred. What about you, Troy? Are we gonna oh. are we gonna, are we gonna hear your voice more in the podcast or what? <laughs> well, I keep wondering how to leverage the uh, the Warlord gaming I'm doing into a podcast, but the bold action uh, arena is over podcasted right now between the juggernaut snafu bacon burgers cast dice and i think there's one or two more i'm forgetting there's a lot of uh, a lot of traffic on bold action and then warlord just keeps cranking out the games it's like we need one game that just takes off and gets a good following Black but <laughs> <laughs> Dennis and I could run that, but unfortunately, my uh, my local gaming group, I've got two uh, wonderful people that are painting up black powder Napoleonics with me, and I've got one other that's uh, working to do the new epic Civil War stuff. Yeah. So it's possible, but you've got to remember, that's not the most exciting game system out there. Which one? It, black powder? Black powder. It's it's designed to be a good uh Friday night with your mates, eight by ten hanging out at the Perry Twins house or eight by twelve gaming table hanging out there and to get you across the table fast enough to actually shoot and maybe get into combat. Well, what I, I definitely think we need a, a Warlord podcast just to discuss when it comes to I bought heavily into Civil War Epic. Matter of fact, there's boxes I was telling these guys before that just have not been painted. And and I think Dennis said it right. I need an event to kick my ass to start painting. So, you know, but I think the Epic is kind of cool because I always wanted to do Civil War. And uh, <laughs> rumor has it that there's another Epic that's going to follow it. Um, but I don't know if it's rumor. So I'm not going to say anything. Yeah. Because I know John Russell listens to us. Um, <laughs> if there's but, French in it, I'm in. <laughs> uh, I'll put it that way. Yes, uh, there are. It's um, it's uh, it's uh, France 1940. Very gameable. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll Sister tell you some of, some of the things that we have been doing is that we a lot of um, people that write. Um, rules that are not from the mainstream companies have approached us um just last week bello ludi who i talked to and we're going to get him on a podcast showed me his civil war rules um for uh team building and they were excellent so folks like that you know the little green army men game that we did a uh a story on so we're getting approached more to do those kind of things and i'm excited that i think we're going to you know, be doing more of that. Um, this year, I we wanted to put more of an emphasis on board gaming. And I got to tell you, like, just with the articles that we've had come out, we've gotten a lot more uh, hits and looks because now we're covering the other side of war gaming. And I don't know if anybody here was a board war gamer at one time. I know I was and uh, still am. So covering that... Um, you know, we're going to start doing more of that. We are going to be running tournaments. And yes, we will record at Historicon because anytime we can get a, a mic in front of Rufus Devane is an awesome time. But uh, I think that we're going to continue down this trajectory. You know, I was looking and I believe last week was the first week in 38 months. We did not run a Flames of War article during the week or a Battlefront article. Troy. Yeah, that's yeah. flames and Team Yankee is one of those that is we're either glutted with stories because of new releases and battle reports, et cetera, because of that new release, or welcome to 2020, 2021, where yeah. it's tough to play. So 
And of course, everybody's supply chain is disrupted. So their production schedules are all, we think it's going to happen. We hope. Yeah. But as as Tom said, you know, and that's the thing, like, you know, during COVID, Hey, Mm -hmm. let's do painting articles, painting. And you know, I tell you what about Scott Roach. I love the man, but he paints and he puts all of his pictures on Facebook. And I go, you know, people would love to know how you did that. Ah, nobody cares. <laughs> as he gets as he gets seventy <laughs> questions or like hundred and twenty likes. And I'm like, you know, I've seen you writing, it's not great, but uh, you know, how about doing that? But I you know, the real point was that's a long time to go with continuously talking about some of these games and you know, looking around at the Firelock articles we did <clears throat> and you know how we're expanding. Um I think it's great. Um, I've never asked anybody to come write for us, believe it or not. I, I I don't like doing that because the people that we've had come on board that have done nothing, I I feel like that's horrible. Um, so I, I, I wait to get asked. But folks that are out there, come contact us if you have stuff you really want to write. Like Patrick, who's been writing a bunch of great articles, you know, I think he writes better than I do because he's a professional writer. So hopefully we get more folks like that. And then, you know, we did the thing with Casemate um, last year and I got to interview Tom Lewis. Well, you know, after some, you know, time off because we haven't heard from them, uh, they came back to us and said they really want to do some more interviews. So we have some folks that are going to be doing stuff for Casemate. And I I know it's not gaming, but these are books that gamers read. So I think we got. I still need my copy stuff. of that book, by the way. I need you to just send me that so I can read it and interview which it again. Which one? Which one? The uh... Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, it's, well, send it, it to a... me again. I read the Remind Korean War me. one. That was really good. The Korean War one's like a collection of stories and stuff. I was ready to do that with um, colleague years from the Air Force. We had like pre meetings about it, made up our list of questions, and then just never heard back from the author. But it was a cool book. Um, it was like Baker's Boys. That was yeah. the one we read. I really don't yeah. give a plug for the book. It's a good book. Um, I'll also sh- send a shout out to uh, to David Garvin, I think is the guy who did the ASL stuff. But yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm an ASL guy. I like ASL. My friend Tucker is a big ASL guy. So I think that's an awesome thing to go into because there's so much variety in those. I will also say that maybe the reason that Scott doesn't write any articles <laughs> is because he's still bitter about that time that you kept telling him the wrong way when he was driving us around to that con and you just had him going in circles. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. I uh so should I tell the story now before we sign off? <laughs> yeah, please. All right. So I love Scott, but I you know, far be it for me to ever kind of goat somebody into anger. So um we we got a bunch of hotel rooms near King of Prussia where the con was being held, and he just starts yelling at me of where to turn. And the first time we made the mistake in turn was totally by accident but he kept yelling at me and i'm like well turn here are you sure well you know and tom's in the back of the car and scott just kept getting angrier and angrier Angrier and angrier uh, and i'm like wait this is it and uh you know it's just funny because we still talk about this stuff you know he's like you knew exactly where you were going because you'd lived there for several years at one point i think you said you oh yeah i I know my way around um yeah you're just just intentionally steering him in a circle but I wasn't paying attention for the first one. And then I'm like, wait, hold on. And that was part of it, too. The only way I knew how to go was for us to go back and backtrack. So I'm sorry. But I love Scott. He's awesome. And um, I'll, I'll say this. He he is very easy to get going. But he'll he be is, yeah. to admit that. <laughs> He's almost too easy. Uh, He's almost too easy. Um, so, look, I... I before I turn it back to you guys, I really want to thank you guys for doing this um, for the last year. I think that the hard work everybody's put in has really paid off. When folks send us messages, you know, I I always look at this as a team event and I like being, you know, a supporter of, uh, you know, what's that thing? I'm not a hero, but I'm in a company of heroes. I really have enjoyed so much doing stuff with you guys over the year and you know especially you troy have have kept the heartbeat of no dice no glory going um some of our most popular podcasts are are tom's um with uh, ed battle buddy ed and i know that now that's not ed sales so i'm sorry about that tom um 
but I, I just really just want to right. thank you guys for, for, for doing all you did over the last year. I, I didn't, to be honest with you, I thought doing the pace that we planned on doing and then having it going three and a half years later, I, I said, you know, I, I don't know like, where this is going to be. And, you know, no doubt, um, we, most of us, all of us came from WWPD for the most part. And, you know, I'm not trying to give those guys a dig, but we both in, in amount of content and amount of hits surpassed them quite some time ago. And uh, got to put a shout out to those guys. But, you know, it was the coalition of the willing and motivated that came out of that that made us great. So I want to thank you guys so much. And please keep me a part of your great team. And I'm going to turn it back to uh, Tom. And then we can go down the line. And uh, we'll send, Troy, you can send it back to uh, Sean when you're done. All right. Well, thanks, Mitch. Thanks, everybody. Uh, looking forward to uh, more good times from No Dice, No Glory and some uh, great content to follow. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for uh, staying with us and uh, hope to see you. Well, I will be at Historicon this year, uh, hopefully losing many games in Team Yankee and uh, maybe winning a few in Flames of War. Uh, bring your Geppards. You know, I love those. And uh, catch you guys uh, at Historicon. But I'll also throw out a shout out to um to Luke Melia and Steve McLaughlin and John Baber because they're they're the first crew of guys that ever thought that people might be interested in anything I had to write. Um and I was grateful to have an opportunity to continue it here. Thanks in large part to Troy, um, who's been just instrumental in making sure that he corrals the herd of cats that is the writers to contribute to this blog. And um and Mitch for being the guy who's willing to, you know shake hands, talk to people and, and bring in all these folks that I never would have ever had a chance to meet before. Um, I'm flattered people listen to these and I'm flattered that people are interested in what I have to write. And I hope to continue doing this as a part of my hobby because I really enjoy it. And moving into 2022, we're going to have hopefully a pretty darn good year of gaming once all this uh, health emergency is behind us. I know this year the only convention I'm able to get to is the Michigan GT. Look for me at the Warlord booth. I'll be up there helping John do whatever it is John does, push those games out. Um, Historicon, unfortunately, can't make it this year. Got to go to an author thing on the other side of the continent. But We've got a good crew of people here. I'm looking at our uh, pending queue right now, or as we call it, the drafts folder. We've got uh, 30-some articles in there in process of being written. Another eight in the pending folder ready to be published. And we've got some old ones. (laughs) I I gotta laugh. We've got one in here about the uh, Star Wars Armada Super Star Destroyer that's been sitting there because we couldn't get pictures. So hopefully someday that'll come out and <laughs> and Empire, we'll you mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh we've got a lot of good uh a lot of good people on staff, both past, present, and hopefully future we'll get some people in. Uh look for some more games coming out. Like our local crew here in uh, northern Indiana is very into saga, so I'll probably be writing some uh battle reports and uh, experiences as a newbie in that. Of course, Warlord makes tons of figures for that, so you know where I'm going to get my stuff. But we've we've had a good, what is it now, three, three and a half years? So hopefully it's a big shout out to the, the listeners, to the readers. You guys are what really makes this blog and this podcast continue it's your hits, your comments, your likes that keep us going. So in the words I keep hearing from John Russell every time he does one of his Warlord Wednesdays, may your beverages be cold, may your um, dice be hot, and may your gaming keep on going. So I'll throw it back to Sean. Go ahead and take us out. Thanks so much for joining the show tonight. Remember to follow us on Twitter at No Dice, No Glory, 
and keep the conversation going on NoDiceNoGlory.com, now featuring our own message boards. Have a great night, everybody.